thank you all to the speakers who preceded me. So, here we are again. Or I should say, first of all, how many of you have you been to three or more of these gatherings? Just give a shout out. And for how many of you is the first one you've ever been? How many of you are under the age of 25? And how many of you are over the age of 60? Let me tell you something. We are all the future of this movement, right? We are all the future. You know, it is the young, the old, and the in-between, the black and the white and the in-between, the gay and the straight and the in-between, the drug users and the non-drug users and the in-between. It really is a remarkable moment right now. Some of us have been fighting this for many years, but every one of us who's been in this for many years knows the same thing as those of us for whom this is a new thing, which is we have just begun to fight. We have just begun to fight. Because the fact of the matter is what we're involved in here inescapably is a multi-generational struggle. This is a multi-generational struggle. There is no 18th Amendment of drug prohibition that is simply going to be repealed with a 21st. There is no Berlin Wall of drug prohibition that has come, come tumbling down like that and transformed the world. We have to push, and we have to push, and we have to build, and we have to be smart. We have no alternative. Now, we also know that the unexpected can happen when you least expect it. We know that a monstrous empire like the Soviet Union can crumble when nobody thought it was possible. And we know that a black man with a name like Barack Obama can become president when nobody thought that was possible. We know that the inconceivable can happen, and part of what it is incumbent upon us to do is to keep envisioning the future. It's envisioning a future in which drugs are going to be as much a part of our lives as ever. Not because that is a good thing or a bad thing, but because that is simply the way it is. What we can change is not the realities or the existence of drugs in our society. What we can change somewhat is the harms that are associated with these drugs. But what we can change fundamentally is how the government and we the people deal with the reality of drugs in our society. Now, it's hard sometimes as an American to look at this thing with no blinders. It's embarrassing to represent a nation that has less than 5% of the world's population but 25% of the world's incarcerated population. It is humiliating to live in a country which has increased by tenfold the number of people locked up on drug charges since 1980. It is horrific to exist in a society which allowed a quarter million of our fellow citizens to die of HIV AIDS because we would not embrace the common sense and scientific approaches that were established and implemented elsewhere. In a country of the Bill of Rights to see the war on drugs being used to eviscerate fundamental freedoms, is an embarrassment to preach to others about the significance of human rights when we ourselves do not know how to respect those in our own society is the ultimate height of hypocrisy. Yeah. That is our tragic exceptionalism, that we have allowed this issue to become a vehicle for oppressing the poor, the vulnerable, and people of color in a way that almost no society has ever done that did not have institutionalized racism on the laws, on the books of its society. But you know, <laughs> we're making progress. We are making progress. We are making progress. You know, when that Global Commission on Drug Policy stood up earlier this year and former presidents stood up and they said, 
Time for change, time to put legalization of marijuana, time to roll back the horrors of the drug war, time to advance with harm reduction. They were saying and doing the right thing, and they were catalyzing a debate around the world that began to penetrate not just around America and Europe and Latin America, but into Asia and Africa. When old drug warriors like Jesse Jackson and Charlie Rangel switch sides and want to link arms with us, that's a form of progress. When people show up in this hall in numbers that have never happened before, that too is progress. When Barack Obama got elected, and in the first year of his administration, somewhat to my surprise, he made good on his campaign commitments. In that first year, what did he do? He did, in fact, roll back the oppression of federal agents in terms of medical marijuana. He did, in fact, go forward with Congress, finally, after many decades, legalizing funding for needle exchange. He did assist in rolling back the harsh and racially unjust crack powder penalties. That was progress. It's progress when we begin to see America turning and we see fewer people locked up in state prisons last year and this year than, it, than we have after 30 years of increases. It's progress when not just Democratic governors but Republican governors embrace prison reforms, whether, for, whether it's for budgetary reasons or moral reasons or whatever. It's progress when right-wingers stand up and create a right-on-crime initiative and say that it's, we have gone too far in incarceration in our country. It's progress when we look around Europe and we see the Portuguese experiment getting more and more notice, and we see the Danes moving forward in this way, and the Norwegians in that way, and the Poles in that way, and the Israelis in that way. It's progress when people start talking about the human rights of drug users in Asia and in Latin America. It is progress when people stand up and when a bold social movement leader like Javier Cecilia can speak a movement about transforming drug policies that is entirely consistent with what the people on the right are saying as well, the former presidents and prime ministers of Mexico and other countries as well. It is a progress when we can force the American bureaucracies to begin to shift direction in all of this. But of course that progress is too little, too slow. Barack Obama, Barack Obama, we needed you, man. We needed you. We needed you to step up there. We needed you to do the right thing, and it looked like you were going to do it. And what's happened? What's happened? Now, I'm not going to blame it all on you. When the Republicans take over the Congress and you got a guy like Lamar Smith trying to come up with the latest crazy drug war idea, when you got state legislatures and Republican leaders allying with Democratic leaders to ban people from receiving unemployment benefits because they smoked a joint, when you have a new drug emerging and people got to ban salvia or K2 or spice or bath salts, I mean, don't they have better things to do already? But it's like, it's like Gavin said, you know, we live in a world in which there is not just the continuing viciousness of a prison industrial complex desperately defending its own interests, of prison guards unions and private prison builders. And the worst of all, the worst of all the drug warriors, I have to say, I believe, are the prosecutors, the district attorneys and the U.S. attorneys. You know, more and more police kind of get it. They keep going along with it. It's part of what they do. They got to bust people. They want the excuse to do it. They got the laws. But the growth of our allied organization, LEAP, is ample evidence that more and more law enforcement is seeing the light on this stuff. The people in charge of running prison populations, they know they're overflowing with people who don't belong behind bars, and more of them are beginning to say we need change. The judges are saying, what are we doing? We're just, we're just rubber stamping horrific sentences that may have no justice in a democratic society. But the DAs and the prosecutors, they are out of control in American society today. They are out of control. If there is anybody who is standing up as the enemies of drug policy reform today, with a few brave exceptions around the country, it is the DAs and the prosecutors, and they have to be called out. You know, 
when they believe that they need a mandatory minimum sentence. Why? Not because that mandatory minimum sentence is justified, but because it moves the power over sentencing from the judge into their hands. Why do they want that mandatory minimum? So they can take some innocent person caught up on the edges of a conspiracy, so they can take that girlfriend of a drug dealer, so they can take a person who has done almost nothing at all and they can threaten with them with a 5 or 10 or 20 year sentence in order to become an informant and give the state what it needs. You know, for so many of us, for so many of us who see ourselves as progressives in America and who continue to believe that government can do well if only it has the right leadership, we also understand the great evil that government can do. That even a democratic society, a reputedly democratic society like the United States of America can do. That when you put these hands and when legislators make these laws and when they let prosecutors run rampant, that leads to injustice of the sort that we see in America today. Look what's happening with respect to people being incarcerated for five and 20 years for possession of small amounts of a white powder substance. Look what's happening when state laws on medical marijuana are being overwhelmed by federal law enforcement authorities that say it's all against federal law and we're going to do whatever we do regardless of public opinion, public health, public safety, public decency. Because we have the power and we will exercise it. We need you, Barack Obama, to reel that back in. And we need all of you and all of us to put the pressure on. The fact of the matter is, if they're doing the wrong thing, it's because we're not yet powerful enough. Part of what we have to do is become not just respected, but feared. We have to grow and grow and grow. We got to get smarter and smarter and smarter. Now, what does that mean? It means that as we take the next stage of evolution as a movement, we have to keep certain things in mind. Whenever I hear somebody say, why can't we all just get along? I say to them, shut the hell up. <laughs> what do you get the hell along? We're people. We're human beings. We're taking on the government. We don't agree on everything. We're going to fight. We're going to struggle. We're going to over tactics and strategies, over ends and means, over girlfriends and boyfriends and credit and money and everything else. But what's going to make us more powerful and more effective is our ability to manage those conflicts like adults. We need, we need to bring to this movement the passion of great lovers and the wisdom of old souls. That's what's called upon for us. We need to fight with one another, but we need to keep our eye on the prize. We need to remember where we're going, right? We can't let ourselves be separated or distinguished because of our different views. You know, some of you have heard me say this before. Many of you have not. For those that I apologize. But when people ask, who is this movement? Who is this drug policy reform movement? And some of them will say, I know who all of you are. You're just the people who want to get high. <laughs> want to smoke your weed and don't care. And you know what I say to them? There's a little truth in that. <laughs> because we are, many of us, the people who do want to get high and who we do enjoy marijuana, and that marijuana being good to us, not bad to us. And we are the people who have lives have been enriched by the psychedelic experiences from LSD to mushrooms and ayahuasca. And we are the people who have even figured out how to play with the more dangerous drugs without getting caught up by them. We are the people who say, if this is my pleasure or this is my vice, then it's no damn business of the government or my employer what I put into my body. And there is no basis for treating me like a common criminal. Get the government out of my face and my boss out of my face. But you know who else we are? We are also the people who hate drugs. We are the people who have seen the worst that drugs can do. We are the people living with addiction in our own lives, in our own families, in our communities. We are the people who have lost children to an overdose, and a brother or sister to HIV, and a cousin to Hep C, and whose parents were alcoholics or drug addicts. We are the people who have seen the gateway theory manifest itself in our own lives and families. We are the people who wish 
that we could have a drug-free society and a drug-free world, but who know that that is not possible and who know that no matter how much we hate drugs, that the war on drugs is not the way to deal with the reality of addiction and drugs in our society. And you know who else we are? We're the people who don't give a damn about drugs. We're the people who don't consider ourselves drug users. I mean, our kid may be on Ritalin, our wife's on Prozac, grandpa's on Viagra, you know, they why they But we don't see ourselves as drug users. What do we care about? We care about fundamental freedom and preserving the Bill of Rights in America. What do we care about? We care about ending the violence and degradation and corruption in Mexico and other countries that have been harmed so horrifically by the drug war. What do we care about? About ending the racial injustice and the class injustice of the war on drugs in our society. What do we care about? About treating addiction as a health issue. What do we care about? Individual freedom and human rights and civil rights and all of the important values that we care about and that we target the war on drugs because it is the single most vicious thing undermining the values that we care about deeply. So who are we, this emerging drug policy reform movement? We are the people who love drugs. We're the people who hate drugs. And we're the people who don't give a damn about drugs. But every one of us believe that the war on drugs is not the way to deal with this reality in our society. When, when, when people who are embracing 5 and 10 and 20 years in recovery can stand up and say, legalize marijuana, when people who have lost somebody to a drug overdose can stand up and say, end the incarceration, when people who believe that marijuana is the greatest medicine on the world can stand up with the doctors and the people suffering for pain for whom marijuana is not the answer, for whom a well-regarded opiate drug is the answer, then we become a movement. When the people on the left and the people on the right, when the Gavin Newsoms and the Gary Johnsons can stand up together, then we are a movement. When the young and the old stand up together, then we are a movement. And when we can envision a future a future not in which our leftist ideals or our rightist ideals are the ones that vanquish, but where we envision a future in which we represent the radical center, <laughs> in which we represent, we represent the people who believe in the fundamental decency of mankind, who believe that government can occasionally do good, but always has to be held accountable, when we understand that nobody but nobody should be discriminated against or amongst because of what they put in their body, when we understand that our love or hatred of drugs cannot divide us, it's all about fighting the oppression of the government and of the popular mindset that oppresses us, then we are a movement. When we can envision a future, Sometimes I look at the societies that have fought wonderful fights against dictatorship. I look in South Africa and I look in the southern cone of Latin America and other places. And what happened when truth and justice went out? What did they do? Did they massacre the people who had oppressed them? No. They set up the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. I dream of the day when we have the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions and where the people who participated in the war on drugs will be brought before to confront their victims, the people whose lives they destroyed because they were just part of the system and just doing their job. And will they will be obliged to confront what it is they did, not with the threat of death or being treated as they treated others, but with the understand that we need to evolve towards a different future. And you know who will be the advisors and consultants on those commissions? It'll be the brave men and women of LEAP, right? It'll be the law enforcement officers who fought this battle for years and came to the realization that it wasn't right. Now, of course, you know, some people say, how do we do this? I mean, don't we ultimately have to control drugs? Don't we have to control them at the source? You know, look what's going on right now. What is the future of drugs in our society and elsewhere? To some extent, of course, it's the pharmaceutical drugs. I mean, we're always going to have marijuana and coke and cocaine and the opiates and hallucinogens, right? They're not going away. They've been around for thousands of years in most cases. They're going to keep being around and people are going to keep loving them and getting in trouble with them, right? 
But the pharmaceuticals, what did the Centers for Disease Control just come out yesterday and say that now, for the first time in American history, more people died of an accidental overdose involving a drug, typically a pharmaceutical drug, than from an automobile accident? And our government can't think of anything better to do than to crack down on, 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 I mean, pain mills this and pharmaceutical that. All they can think about is once again reverting to supply control, supply control, punishment, punishment, punishment. They can't think of anything else. You know, sometimes I think, you know what we might have a good model in for dealing with drugs? There is this other substance out there. It's a substance, it's a substance that almost every one of us consumes. It's a substance that fills our life with joy and can also fill it with immense pain. It's a substance we can't live with and we can't live without. It's a substance that is woven onto society so it's impossible to imagine a future without it. It's one that we use in moderation and one which so many of our deaths are addicted to. What is that substance? The automobile. Now think about it. What's happened over the last 20 or 30 years? The number of automobiles on the roads has increased by what, 50%? The number of drivers by 30%, 40%? The number of miles driven by 50 or 100%, right? All of the things going up, more cars, more drives, more miles, right? And the conventional model would say that's going to mean more automobile-related problems. But what's happened during that same 30 years? The number of people dying on the roads has dropped. The amount of pollution being put into the air has dropped. The amount of injuries happening has dropped. It seems to me that automobiles, while not a perfect model, is an example where we acknowledge the inevitable reality that something can become, proliferate in our society, become more and more common, more and more used, but nonetheless, through intelligent policies, we can reduce the harms that are being caused both to ourselves and to others. That automobiles provides a wonderful example of a harm reduction strategy. Whether we like it or not, our children, our grandchildren are going to live in a world with far more psychoactive drugs than we have today. We are going to have Prozac Generation 12 and Viagra Generation 4 and Riddle and Generation 23 and neat little combinations of all of them, right? We can choose on our own selves to be pharmacological Luddites and abstain from all of these things, but we cannot mandate that the government require all of us to abstain from all of these things, or else we will replicate and continue the war on drugs into the future with a new threat. We have to understand that when we fight against the war on drugs, we have to be clear about our principles and not all of a sudden be caught by surprise when something comes out of nowhere and also we abandon our core principles and apply the same horrific values of the war on drugs to this new threat. Sometimes I think about what happened in the inner cities of America in the 1980s, right? When crack cocaine came along and the crack craze and the fear and people who were poor and black and oppressed and they saw this stuff coming and what did they do? What did they do? The leaders, the Jesse Jacksons and Charlie Wrangles, the church leaders, but even the average people, what did they do? They said, we need more treatment. Yeah, we need more treatment. We need more investment in our communities, but you know what else we need? We need more police. We gotta arrest those people selling those drugs. We gotta arrest those people using those drugs. Even if they are us, we have to do that. They called on, they called for more law enforcement and more prisons, and what happened was an unprecedented incarceration of people of color in our society that made incarceration rates in, Soviet, in, in, incarceration rates in South Africa of black men look like petty in comparison. That made the incarceration rates of the Soviet gulags in the 30s, 40s, and 50s look petty in comparison. We built prisons to house millions of Americans, mostly people of color. We shipped them from inner cities to upstate. The largest housing program in America became not building housing for families in the inner cities, but building upstate prisons and employing undereducated white prison guards to guard undereducated black convicts. The lesson of that is it is always a mistake to call in our oppressors to save ourselves from ourselves. It is always a mistake to call in our oppressors to save ourselves from ourselves. 
Now, what are we here? I know we disagree. Some of you say let's legalize everything, and some of you say let's legalize nothing but just treat addiction as a health issue. The way I see it, we are trying to move both public consciousness and public policy down a spectrum. We are trying to move it from the spectrum from this side of the war on drugs in Singapore and Malaysia and China and Indonesia and the standard American policy of lock them up and drug test them and torture them over here down this end. Now, what's down at this end? Well, at the far end, of course, is the free market. It is Milton Friedman's wet dream. It is the way of dealing with drugs and, you know, of true freedom. But where the debates need to move, where the policies need to move, is down this spectrum. I look forward to the day when the most vicious fights, the ones that are most consequential for drug policy in America, are the ones that happen among ourselves where we are fighting at this part of the spectrum between those who are saying make it all legal except for kids and those who are saying harm reduction, harm reduction, harm reduction, we can't let go of all prohibitionist controls, treat addiction as a health issue, decriminalize, but do not allow the Marlboroization or the Budweiserization of drugs in America. Those are the fights we need to have. Those are the fights we know that the best trial, all the science, the evidence, the history suggests that the best drug policy is the one that lies at this end of the spectrum at that end of the spectrum. Now, part of what makes this challenge is that our movement for freedom and social justice is in fact different in some respects than others. One of the things that makes it different, and we have to be frank and honest in dealing with, is that ours, unlike the movements for civil rights and gay rights and women's rights, involves a commodity. It involves something that people can and do and will make money from. It means that when we fight for the freedom of people to take the drugs and not be discriminated based on that, when we fight for freedom, to, for freedom of people to grow their own medicine or their own cannabis or whatever it might be, when we fight for the rights of indigenous peoples to grow the co coca or opium that's been part of their societies, it's also recognizing that when we're fighting for those freedoms, we're also fighting in some respect for something that is a commodity, that is a commodity. Look what's happening today. And part of what's going on with medical marijuana is that a lot of people are making money, some of them ethically and some of them not so ethically, from marijuana, from medical marijuana. We're trying to bring this stuff above ground and we have to do it in responsible ways. We can see what's going on in the Netherlands now where you have a right-wing government trying to shut down the coffee shops, that they hovered in that middle ground for so many years where they never legalized the thing entirely and never fully regulated it, but they kept it in a decriminalized, not just possession, but decriminalized retail marketplace, that that is inherently unstable. That's where we are with medical marijuana today. It means that as we try to move this thing forward, we have to bolster our defenses. We have to be smart. We have to call out the entrepreneurs who are acting unethically in this world. We can't give the excuse to the federal prosecutors and the others to target the whole industry. We can't have the bad role models who become the symbol that the opposition weighs in our face. It's one of the challenges we have to be honest with, that this is a fight for freedom and decency and human rights, but with this commercial element, it needs to be managed responsibly. I don't, I don't care whether it's for profit or not for profit, all these sorts of things. That can be decided locally. And we're not going to have the luxury. We're not going to have the luxury that people happened that happened with the repeal of alcohol prohibition. You know, with the repeal of alcohol prohibition, it could go like that. And many of the I won't call out their names, but many of the people who made the most money selling alcohol illegally could become the legal sellers. It happened quickly, but we're going to go through this, we are going through this transitional stage where we have no alternative but to manage this stuff as best we possibly can. Now, every time I look around me, I say something about this struggle, it's getting more complicated. It's getting more complicated. The oppression is as real and horrific as ever but it's getting more complicated. We're drafting ballot initiatives and we're fighting over where do we compromise on principle and policy and which interests get represented. We're fighting over legislation and we have to battle over this. We're fighting over resources. We have to keep making these judgments in the best possible way we can. Building a movement, taking it to the next stage means not being distracted by the money that can be made or the burnout or the fights that can happen. Now, I'm inspired when I look 
at what's happening with the Occupy Wall Street movement. I'm inspired when I see what's happening with the Arab Spring, when something that was as inconceivable as the fall of the Soviet Union or as inconceivable as a black man being elected president is happening around us. I know that we can keep moving, but I also know that the nature of our movement is that we will never be able to put the people on the streets the way that the civil rights movement did. We don't have that capacity to do it. We have to be savvy. We have to be wily. But the fact of the matter is, we are standing on the shoulders and following in the footsteps of other movements for social justice and individual freedom. The fact of the matter is, is that we are like the movements for civil rights and gay rights and for the abolition of slavery indeed. The fact of the matter is that we are fighting for fundamental freedoms and fighting against entrenched interests. The fact of the matter is that the economics of the argument are on our side, whereas the powerful economic interests are on the other side. The fact of the matter is, is that the only way we ultimately win this battle is we take on what may be the greatest challenge of all and the greatest enemy of all, it's the one that lies within. Whenever we doubt our own convictions, whenever we believe on some level that our struggle for the human rights of people who use drugs is somehow a lesser struggle than the struggle for civil rights or women's rights or gay rights or other movements for social justice and freedom, we undermine our own efficacy and power. You know, the early generations of women fighting for women's rights, so many of them kept within their own consciousness that on some level they weren't truly the equal of men. That for black men and women fighting for equal rights and civil rights who believed on some level they weren't fully their equal because they brought up in the days of Jim Crow or slavery and they fought for the struggle they fight. But some level deep down they couldn't buy into it. All the others, I mean, it's the story, of course, of, you know, of Moses and the Israelites leaving Egypt and slavery and getting caught up by the golden calf because on some level after generations of slavery, the first generations could not embrace what freedom and independence truly meant. They had to grasp onto the old straws and fears of the past because that's what had been impregnated in their brains as they were children. We have to free ourselves of that. And we also have to know that if there is one quality that is required of us more than any other, more than the intellect, more than courage, it is the quality of empathy. The only way we win, the only way we win, we don't have the option of beating up the opposition. They got the guns and the prisons and they still got the laws and they got the prejudices and they got the fears. They have so much on their side they can just stomp all over us. We win when we extract every ounce of empathy we have within ourselves when we can embrace and open our hearts to the law enforcer who has done his job, sometimes courageously for 20 years, and where we have been the victim, and to say, and to reach into them and appeal to them and find the language that will bring them over here. We show our empathy and we win when we can reach and embrace the person who has struggled with addiction in their families and lost people to, to horrible drug fatalities and hates drugs, when we can reach over and explain and commiserate and feel deep down, not just here, but here, people people suffering around drugs. To the extent that we are seen as people who are pro-drug, that we cannot win. It is only by understanding deeply, profoundly, the fears that exist around drugs. Every parent's fear for their kid. Everybody's fear for the loss of control of drugs. Everybody's desire to control their environment. Everybody's desire to build that moat between their children and those drugs. It is only when we extract that empathic dimension of ourselves that we win. For the next three days, if you're a marijuana activist, go to panels that have nothing to do with marijuana. If you're a harm reduction activist, go to panels that have nothing to do with harm reduction. If you're an American activist, go to panels that have nothing to do with America. Go and launch out. I want you to be leaving this place Transform. I want each one of you to be starting from what brought you to this movement, whatever piece it was, and going on to the next level. Because we are a movement that is going to grow and grow and grow. We are going to become more and more powerful. We're going to end the prison. We're going to use the economic arguments. We're going to use every argument at our disposal. And we're going to fight 
fight, fight for the principle that nobody but nobody deserves to be punished for what we put in our bodies absent harm to others. That nobody but nobody deserves to be harmed for what, what we put into our bodies. This is a fight for freedom and sovereignty and dignity. This is a fight for justice. You are, we are the vanguard of this movement. Let's change the world. Thank you very much.